If you have a Bible with you or a Bible app or whatever, if you could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, this is part 10 in a series that we began, as you can see, quite some time ago. Uh, but we're going to uh, uh, delve into some more things today because I think it's so imperative uh, that we deal with the, the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit because that is what Jesus intended. He intended for the church of Jesus Christ uh, to have the Holy Spirit working in them, working through them, uh, ministering through them to others, uh, thank God for the presence of God available to us as believers. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so let's, let's, uh, let's delve into this again. As you see, this is part 10 in this. You're turning in your Bibles or opening your app to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. And uh, we're going to read this as our main text as we delve into the gifts of the Spirit. Now, in talking about the Holy Spirit, uh, we mentioned the fact that there are two foundational experiences of the Holy Spirit in our lives. First and foremost, and the most important, is being born of the Spirit, right? The moment you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's a new birth that takes place on the inside of you. Uh, you are changed. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. You're a new creation in Christ uh, because of the regeneration of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so you became, as Paul referred to us, as new men or new women. May have not looked any different on the outside, but on the inside, we were instantaneously changed uh, the moment we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit came to dwell on the inside of us. Amen? Is that by women here today? I mean, this could be and should be exciting to us. And I have uh, really uh, said from the beginning that we need to become more conscious. And if there's anything that I think the Lord would have as a goal for this series is that we as believers become more conscious of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The more conscious we are of the Holy Spirit in our lives, uh, the more we're going to walk uh, free from anxiety, free from depression, uh, free from uh, anything that might hinder us from having victory in our lives. The more conscious we are of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And now I'm not talking about uh, being so, as people say, so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. No, the more conscious we are of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the more earthly good we are. Are you following what I'm saying to you? Amen. Amen. And, and so, you know, I'm not talking about walking on some kind, kind of cloud, oblivious to your surroundings and, and acting weird. I'm talking about just simply being conscious of the presence of God in your life within you uh, by way of the Spirit of God who's regenerated you and made you a new person. And then also a second foundational experience of the Holy Spirit in our lives is called the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And we saw that that is subsequent to or follows being born of the Spirit, but they are both foundational and they are both what God intended for every believer to experience. Every believer is to experience this subsequent or this experience that follows the new birth or born of the Spirit. Every believer is to experience this baptism with the Holy Spirit. And the initial physical evidence biblically is the speaking in a heavenly language, a spiritual language, or as some refer to, and even most of our Bibles, another tongue. Speaking in other tongues is biblical. It's biblical, and it was always intended for the church. And so we've looked at some of these things, and we understand, I trust some of these things. Some have actually received this baptism in the Holy Spirit since we began this series, and we're thankful for that. If you did, if you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit since we began this series, and you received your spiritual language, I want to encourage you, pray in the Spirit and with your understanding on a regular basis. You don't have to do it. In fact, you probably shouldn't do it in front of other people unless they're praying with you and that kind of thing. Pam and I, we pray together. We pray in English and with our understanding, or, or we pray in English and in other tongues. And, and so that's all right, because we both know what we're doing, and we don't get confused by that at all. Amen. Uh, but my point is, continue to do that. Continue to pray in the Spirit and with your understanding in your devotional time. It's so important, because he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, strengthens himself, builds himself up. If you're being tempted to sin, if you have a weakness in your life, one of the things you can do if you're baptized with the, Holy, with the Holy Spirit is begin to pray in the Spirit, pray in other tongues. Yes, another aspect of resisting sin is you speak the Word of God as Jesus did, as it's recorded in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4. The devil came to him uh, on, the, on the mountain of temptation, as they call it, and he spoke the Word and resisted the devil and his temptations by speaking the Word of God. But also, you can do that and should do that, but also, 
also pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit because that gets you out of the flesh and more into the Spirit. And the more out of the flesh you are, the more you'll overcome the temptation of the flesh. Does that make sense? Amen. And, and so again, those things are vital to us. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to begin as we've already delved into this a little bit. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about one of those gifts of the Spirit. I thought we'd get to it last week. We didn't have time. We ran out of time. Uh, we will get to it this week. Uh, and we're going to talk about prophecy. That's one of the nine manifestations or gifts of the Spirit mentioned here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so let's read from the Scripture. And uh, if you have your Bible, Bible app, it's there. I will have it up on the screen for those that might not have brought their Bible, but I encourage you as always, see it in your own Bible. Underline it, highlight any of these Scriptures, uh, whether it's about the gifts of the Spirit or anything. You need to have a Bible, and I know you can do it with your Bible app as well. You can highlight, you can underline, and everything else. I am an adherent to a real Bible. I use electronic Bibles as well. I have a whole software package of hundreds, hundreds of volumes of different books, including different translations, and so I use that as well. And sometimes I use that in order to copy and paste so that you can have a different translation up on your PowerPoint sometimes too, right? So you can see it. Uh, but I'm not against that, but there is something in my, in my humble opinion about having your own Bible and having it marked up with notes on the sign there. there. Something about it, it, it makes it more yours. I'm convinced of that, and I don't care what age group you're a part of. I don't care if you're young or old. There's something about a physical Bible. Now, you could take that or leave it. Maybe you're different than me, uh, and I'm sure you are. Uh, but in any case, some people would say, well, you're just old-fashioned. Well, you know, I think we need a little old-fashioned compared to what the new fashions are. Amen. <laughs> Anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 1. It is on the screen for those of you that need it. It says this, Paul, anointed, inspired by the Holy Spirit, now concerning spiritual gifts. I'll pause there just for a moment. Uh, some have suggested that it really, you know, gifts is in italics, so really it could have been translated concerning spirituals or things that pertain to and are of the Holy Spirit, some suggest. And so concerning these things, brother, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, I'm going to propose to you, as I said, kind of in a different way last week, uh, that unfortunately there is a lot of ignorance about these gifts of the Spirit that he's about to mention. In the body of Christ today, there's very few, as I see anyway. Now, I could be mistaken. I don't hear everybody out there. But I'll tell you, if you do a search uh, online and you try to find teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, it's going to be few and far between. Even amongst charismatic, Pentecostal churches, churches that believe uh, in those uh, and claim they believe in those, uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of teaching about these things. A lot of churches have avoided it. A lot of churches have gotten away from it uh, because, well... I think for a variety of reasons. One reason is because they are too concerned about what people might think. And they're afraid of, of, of uh, you know, trying to, you know, scaring people away by the gifts of the Spirit. I remember years ago, when a, a guy I used to know, uh, and, uh, you know, he was afraid to have his friend come to his church, which was a full gospel church, uh, because uh, there was this one sister who almost every week, uh, she'd give a word from the Lord, and he was afraid to invite his friend uh, because, the, uh, you know, he was afraid the sister so-and-so would scare him away. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, all right? And, and so, you know, he invited him anyway, and he came, and he asked him afterwards, well, what'd you think of the service? He said something to the effect, well, the service was great, but I'll tell you, I wish I had what that lady had. That was really amazing. Well, you know what? What he thought that would be the response of his friend wasn't the response at all. He was blessed by that word from the Lord. Are you following what I'm saying? And sometimes we get it caught up in our minds. Remember I said to you, I think last week, week before, whatever it was, the world is looking, in general, the world is looking for something real and something supernatural. And unfortunately, they're looking for it in all the wrong places, like the old song, looking for love in all the wrong places, right? I know that's a worldly song, and none, you are Christians, all right? Uh, but you, you can't help uh, but hear those songs if you've been around long enough, right? But anyway, they're looking for the supernatural in all the wrong places. Let's show them what the reality of it is. Let's show them the supernatural God that we serve who's greater than anything the enemy, the devil, might have. Isn't that right? 
And again, we cannot conjure these things up. We cannot invent them or, or bring them out ourselves. We've got to depend on the Holy Spirit uh, to do so as He wills. Amen? Uh, but we need not be ignorant. We need to learn as much as we can about these things. So Paul said again, by the Spirit of God, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know, I'm reading on now, you know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts or different kinds, but the same Spirit, excuse me, there are, as we go on with this, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord, and there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Notice the last sentence, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Going on with the next verse, verse 8. For to one is given, and here he delineates the nine manifestations of the Spirit. And so he goes on, for to one who has given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, I emphasize on the screen all the times it mentions the Holy Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing into each one individually as He wills. And so it's all according to what He wills at any particular time. It's what He wills at any particular time that these nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit, these exhibitions, if you will, these showings forth, if you will, of the Holy Spirit, they operate as He wills, not by our will, not by our choice, but as the will of God, uh, as He so chooses to do that. So the nine of them, as you see up on the screen, are delineated there. There's nine of those. And uh, as I mentioned to you last week, there are three categories of the gifts with three in each of those categories. And, and this is something people have put together over the years. And it's helpful to us. As I uh, said last week, you know, I, I think, in myself anyway, you know, God has given us systematic minds, minds that like things uh, in order. It, it helps us. One thing that does is it helps us retain the knowledge or the understanding. Isn't that right? When we can have things said to us or taught to us in an orderly way, uh, we're able to retain those things that much better. And, and it seems that the Bible is not really uh, systematic to that extent. And so having these minds that tend to lean toward wanting things to be orderly or systematic, that shows or that forces us to study the Scriptures so that we put them in a systematic way, and by doing so, we retain a better that which the Scripture teaches. Does that make sense to you? And so even though this is something men have put together, I think that the Spirit of God was involved with putting these categories together. And so the first group is called the vocal gifts, or those that say something. And those vocal gifts that we see out of these nine is prophecy, which we're going to deal with today. Secondly, different kinds of tongues. Now, this different kinds of tongues is not the same tongue or language you received when you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is a public use of tongues that requires the next vocal gift, which is the interpretation of tongues. Now, many people think, and I think that they're probably right in general, is that different kinds of tongues with the interpretation is equivalent to prophecy. We'll talk about that more when we get into it, uh, but all three of these deal with communication. They're vocal gifts that deal with communication, and we'll show you uh, some of the reasons for that or some of the meaning of that as we go on into this. Now, the three categories of the gifts also, there are the revelation gifts or those gifts that reveal something. They're the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. We're not going to get to that quite yet now. And then finally, they are categorized as the power gifts, uh, which are the gift of faith or special faith or wonder-working faith as the Amplified, the classic uh, Amplified translation says, the gift of faith, gifts of healings, and then the working of miracles. And I think everybody would agree we definitely need more of the gifts of healings and working of miracles within the church and outside use, use, being used of God in those areas as well, wouldn't you say? But you see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If we're not having teaching on these things, we will not have faith raised in our, risen in our hearts to, to operate or to receive these things. And so we got to have our faith. And, and you see, the problem is the church overall 
has ignored these things. You know, a lot of churches today, they'll, they'll believe, they still believe uh, that these are from a bygone era, that they stopped when the last apostle died and all of that. And, and so, you know, when it comes to 1 Corinthians, they love 1 Corinthians 11, where it talks about communion and the Lord's table. I, I mean, there's whole denominations. They'll teach 1 Corinthians chapter 11 on the Lord's table. And, and you know what? And, and then they'll skip over and they love 1 Corinthians chapter 13 because that deals with love. That's called the love chapter by some people and what have you. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? Uh, but for some reason, they ignored chapter 12, 12 and chapter 14. For some reason, chapter 11 and chapter 13 are still for today, but chapters 12 and chapter 14 are not for today. Something's wrong with that theology. Are you following me here? Is everybody with me? And, and so we don't want to ignore. We claim to be Bible-believing, full gospel, whole counsel of God people, church. And so if that's the case, we have to include this as well. And really, when you think about it, the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul uh, to write quite a bit about it. All right, here as we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, he deals with more specifics about these vocal gifts in particular. And then in other places, uh, they're mentioned the book of Acts. Luke uh, wrote about instances where some of these things took place as well. And so they are a major part of what the church was involved with and operated in during the biblical times and the writings of the New Testament. And so, again, these things are important going on because of time. Notice I, I left off last time giving you these quotes. I'm going to give them to you again real quickly here. And they went like this. When the gifts of the Holy Spirit are absent, the church experiences less spiritual vitality and effectiveness. Rick Renner goes on. We must embrace these supernatural manifestations knowing that God gave them to the body of Christ because we need them. He never intended for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be a cause for embarrassment. He gave them to make us smarter and sharper. God wants the gifts of His Spirit to impart supernatural wisdom and revelation to us. He designed them to take us higher and to enable us to demonstrate His love and His power on the earth. Now, vocal gifts. Let's talk about this one, prophecy. We saw it delineated in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's talk about prophecy. It is defined this way. Is everybody doing okay yet this morning? Prophecy. To speak by inspiration in the form of prediction or simple discourse. To speak on behalf of another. Let me pause there. Sometimes when people hear the word prophecy, they always think it has to do with predicting the future. But prophecy in and of itself does not have to include prediction of the future. Prophecy in and of itself can be, as it's stated here, a simple discourse or, a, or an encouragement from the Lord. It's speaking on behalf of another. And in our case, it's definitely speaking on behalf of God as one is inspired by the Spirit of God. Not necessarily a future prediction, in fact, the simple gift of prophecy that we're going to deal with primarily doesn't have to have it, often does never have uh, any kind of prediction at all. And we'll see that as we go on. But it's simply the Lord speaking to us through someone to bring edification, exhortation, and comfort into our lives. And then also it's defined this way. The gift of prophecy is the sudden supernatural ability to speak by divine inspiration in the speaker's known language in a language they know. And so it's a sudden supernatural ability to speak by divine inspiration. And so, you know, it can happen uh, as, as you were here. If you were here last week, you know that our sister came up and gave a word, inspired utterance by, by the Spirit of God uh, to exhort, comfort, encourage us, all in line with Scripture. I didn't hear a thing that was not in line with Scripture. And, and that's what it did. It edified, it built us up, it comforted us. It was speaking on behalf of God. It was a biblical thing to do. And, and Paul warns us in another place, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, do not despise prophecies. Do not despise prophesy and, and to not quench the Holy Spirit. Too many churches have quenched the Holy Spirit. And I understand that temptation. Because, you know, we have su such a tendency, all of us do, uh, that we want to be, uh, you know, respected by others, respected by people that come in and, and all of that. Uh, but you know what? We've got to stick to the Word of God. Let's be, if you will, not, not stupid, but let's be, as Paul declared, fools for Christ. If we're adhering to the Scripture, if we're trying our utmost to follow the Word of God as our standard of faith and practice, then we need to at least embrace these things and not reject these things or put them off to a bygone era. All right, now there are three levels of prophecy that we see in the Word of God. Are you getting anything out of this so far? And again, I, I want to share these things 
and I won't finish probably on prophecy today, uh, but I, I want to get to these things because there's a lot of prophesying going out there that we need to know how to judge it. Because the Bible also talk, tells about, in fact, commands us to judge prophecy. And, and in order to judge it, we have to have some guidelines as to how do we do that. And that's part of the goal in talking about prophecy. You know, there was a lot of people out there prophesying, you know, thus saith the Lord, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump will be president again. He'll, he'll be reelected and, and all that kind of thing. Well, that didn't happen during this time. And, and so, you know, you have to wonder. Uh, one guy, he had enough integrity. He said, you know what? I'm stepping down now. I'm not going to be prophesying anymore. I missed it, and I need to kind of get collected again. I need to get myself, uh, you know, adjusted in these things because I missed God. And, and so, uh, you know, he had enough integrity to say, you know what? I prophesied that over and over again. I think he did. And, and then when it didn't happen the way he predicted it to happen, he said, you know what? I miss God. And so he stepped down from ministry, from ministry for a time. I'm not saying he needed to do that, but I'm saying he did that. And that was a, a show of integrity, wanting to please God and do what was right and to prophesy correctly. Amen. Now, first of all, the three levels of prophecy. First of all, the prophecy of scripture. Now, all scripture, as far as the simple definition of prophecy, speaking on behalf of another, all scripture could be said to be prophecy. Even though it's not all predicting the future, it's all, if you will, speaking on behalf of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Yeah. All right, and so in that sense, all Scripture could be considered prophecy. In fact, we won't go there because of time, but 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, it talks about that the prophecy of Scripture was given in old time because holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. And that's speaking of the Old Testament. And it would include predictive kind of prophecy, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's all necessarily predictive. And I also want to say this, you know, uh, the Scripture is all of it is truly stated, but not all of it is truth. This is a sideline, but I think people need to understand that. If you read through your Bible, you know that there's records of things that are truly stated, truly stated, it really happened. I mean, you know, David committing adultery with Bathsheba really happened. But how many of you know that's truly recorded and truly stated, but that's not truth to live by. Are you understand what I'm trying to say? Is everybody with me here today? All right. On the other hand, there's a lot of truth to live by. There's a lot of absolute truth to live by in the Scripture when it has to do with that kind of thing. But other things are just truly stated as having happened but they weren't necessarily the will of God, right? Does everybody follow me here today? All right, so the prophecy of Scripture, we know it's God-breathed. The breath of God is on it, 2 Timothy 3.16. This is the only type that is inerrant or has no errors and is infallible. The prophecy of the Scripture, especially in the original languages. Uh, but, of course, we've got so many translations, we can always get the right message uh, from our translations every single time, especially when you compare translation with translation. You don't have to be concerned about that. And so it's the only type that's inerrant and infallible. And this type is no longer being given today. Don't let anybody tell you that there's more Scripture being written today or since the Apostle John wrote Revelation. There's no more Scripture. I don't care what Joseph Smith thought. He did not write Scripture. Is everybody with me here today? Nor anyone else. And so it is not being given today. Now notice the note here at the bottom of the PowerPoint. The other two levels. Remember, there's three levels talked about in the Scripture of prophecy. The other two levels of prophecy that we're going to refer to in a moment must be measured and judged by this level. This is the highest level, right? If this was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it was then the Holy Spirit will never contradict Himself through someone speaking. It will always be in line with this Scripture. And we need to always keep, keep that in mind, no matter what. Now, the second level, I pray you're getting some out of this, because I know I'm about out of time, but that's all right. We're going to make it. The ministry of the prophet. Now, if you look right there, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I trust. Are you still in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? And so notice now, uh, after you know, we read through verse 11, now we're not going to take time to read from verse 12 on right now anyway. We might in a future time. It talks about and gives the metaphor of the human body, comparing it to the body of Christ and how we are all members one of another and we all have different functions as members of the body of Christ and we're all needed by the other members. We are all needed by each other. You know that, right? 
I mean, you know, my little pinky finger, it, it may not be, it may not be uh, you know, all that important compared to my heart or my liver or whatever, but I still want my little pinky finger. I need it. Are you, you know what I'm saying? All right, and so he gives that metaphor in verses 12 uh, through the end, really. But notice what it says when he gets down to verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 12. Are you there? It says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets. There's that word prophets. There's that ministry of prophet. Third teachers, after that miracles, there are those that actually have a ministry and in the context, it would be synonymous with the working of miracles from the previous part in this same chapter. And so some actually have a ministry of the working of miracles. Then gifts of healing, same thing. Helps is an anointed ministry, a helper in the body of Christ. How many of you know in this listing, nor in any of the listings of the New Testament of ministry, is music ministry mentioned? But I think all of you would agree the music ministry is a great help. Nowhere in any listing that I have found in the New Testament is children's ministry listed, but I think everybody would agree that children's ministry is a great help, right? And we could go on with that. And so helps covers a broad spectrum of different ministries in the body of Christ. And then he says administrations, varieties of tongues. It says he's appointed them. Then he says, are all apostles? What's the understood answer? No. Are all prophets? What's the understood answer? No. And so again, not everybody's a prophet, but yet... We saw a little bit last week. We'll see more in a few moments. Yet God, through the Apostle Paul, said to every believer that you may prophesy. But just because someone prophesies doesn't put them in the ministry of the prophet. Is everybody with me? All right, and then it goes on and it mentions other ministries as well, giftings that are part of those ministries, even diversities of tongues. When it says, do all speak with tongues, he's not talking about uh, the result of, of being baptized with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. He's talking about this ministry in the body of Christ of speaking in tongues with an interpretation by someone else or by the same person. It's a different type of tongue that brings ministry to the body as opposed to that kind of tongue that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you pray and have that spiritual language for prayer. And so that's an explanation of that real brief. But anyway, let's go on uh, with this ministry of the prophet. Prophets, it's up on the screen. Prophets prophesy, but not all that prophesy are prophets. Turn with me, if you don't mind, to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. I pray that you're getting something out of it. This is so important, I think. It's part of the Bible. And we're Bible people, Amen. And we want to know as much as we can the full counsel, the whole counsel of God. And so in Acts chapter 21, this is an interesting, interesting passage here. As we look at some of this and, you know, some of the things that took place with this, and we're going to just uh, kind of look at a few of these verses for sake of time. Uh, but notice now, it says, beginning with verse, I guess we'll start with verse 8 of Acts chapter 21. What verse did I put up there? Uh, I put verse 8. Good. Good. I'm consistent. Notice what it says. Verse 8, Acts 21. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions, remember Luke is the writer by, you know, the Holy Spirit inspired him, but he's the writer of the book of Acts, same one that wrote the gospel of Luke. And so he says, on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, that's back from Acts chapter 6, he was one of the seven deacons or diaconas originally appointed, Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now notice verse 9. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And so he had four daughters who prophesied. But yet notice as we read on with this, very interesting, verse 10, and as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, thus says the Holy Spirit. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this bell and deliver him in, into the hands of the Gentiles. And so Philip had four daughters who prophesied. Why didn't they prophesy to Paul about what was going to happen in Jerusalem? Well, I don't know all the reasons why, but I would, I would submit to you this, that there's a difference in the level of prophecy between those who have that simple gift of prophecy, as apparently these four daughters had, and that those that have the ministry of the prophet. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And so all 
can prophesy, but not everybody's a prophet because a prophet, according to Ephesians 4, it's the next reference or the reference up uh, by uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 on, your, on the PowerPoint up there. We won't take time, but it says in Ephesians chapter 4, it says that when Jesus ascended, he gave gifts unto men and he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. And so this ministry of the prophet, like the pastor, evangelist, teacher, and apostle, is given to the church to equip the saints. And so there's a level of ministry gift there uh, that is necessary for the believer. Saints is equivalent to every believer. You're a saint. And so if you're not a saint before you die, you're not going to be one after you die. You understand that, right? And so you're a saint. Believers are saints according to the Scripture. And so prophets are amongst the five ministry gifts that are part of God's plan to equip, to build up, to edify the body of Christ so that the body can do that which God's called them to do. Does this make sense to you? And so we'll explain that just a little bit more in a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to have to end for today. Now notice up on the screen. This is one of the fivefold ministry gifts which are called to help equip the believer and build up the body of Christ. A prophet speaks on behalf of God and brings teaching, correction, confirming guidance, revelation, and sometimes insight into future events. Now, that's the second level of prophecy. First level, prophecy of Scripture. That's our standard. We measure everything else by that. Second level, this ministry of the prophet. And then the third level is the one that we're really talking about here that's delineated as part of the nine manifestations or gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, the beginning of it. The gift or manifestation of prophecy. This one, as uh, you can see on the screen, anyone can be used in prophecy as the Spirit wills. And for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul said to the church at Corinth, he said in verse 1, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. He said that to the whole church. And so this main or this simple gift of prophecy is for anybody to be operating in as the Holy Spirit wills. He also said in 1 Corinthians 14 at the very end, he says in verse 39, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. says to the whole church. Desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. And so again, this basic, simple gift of prophecy is not the ministry of the prophet, but it's something that God can use anybody in who's willing and as God wills to use them in this. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right. And so going on with this, then notice what the scripture says. It says uh, in 1 Corinthians, again, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with other tongues. Notice, and I'm going to probably end with this next frame. This is a quote uh, from the Fire Bible. Uh, a scholar by the name of Donald Stamps was the editor of that Bible. He's gone home to be with the Lord now. But notice what he says. We must distinguish between prophecy as a temporary or momentary expression of God's Spirit, which is that gift of the Spirit called prophecy that we refer to, and, notice he says distinguish, and prophecy as a ministry gift of the church, which is talking about the gift or the ministry of the prophet. As a ministry gift, prophecy is given only to some who must then function as prophets within the church on an ongoing basis. The gift of prophecy mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 is a periodic manifestation, that is, outward expression of God's Spirit that is potentially available to every Spirit-filled Christian. All right, and so again, we see there is a, a difference between these things. And no matter what it is, we are to judge prophecy whenever we hear it. And as I said, I'm going to have to get into this next time. Now, next Sunday... We have a very special guest speaker. I'm going to be here, but we have a guest speaker. Pastor Sam Smucker is going to come and minister to us. And so I know he's going to be a blessing. Amen. And so and I know some of you really need a break from me. And so you're going to get a break from me. All right. Uh, but he's going to come and I know he's going to get a word from the Lord. But then God willing, after that, we're just going to continue talking about uh, the Holy Spirit in you and, and this area of the manifestation of the Spirit and really deal with how to judge prophecy biblically. What are some of the guidelines the Bible gives us? In fact, before we end, let me give you one more scripture. And I have to have you turn there because I don't have it here. First Thessalonians. Go there if you would real quickly. I quoted part of it, but I want you to see it in your own Bibles. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And this tells us, at least it tells me, 
that the Apostle Paul found that believers in his day were struggling to a certain extent with this idea of the gifts of the Spirit as well, for whatever reason. And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, notice again what it says in verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you there say yes, Paul really encourages the believers and says, Rejoice always. How many of you know that's a good admonition right there? Rejoice always, whether you feel like it or not. Rejoice in God. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit, or the idea is to extinguish the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But notice the next thing. Test all things. Hold fast that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. Notice, though, that after he said, don't quench the spirit, don't despise prophecies, what does he say? Test it all. Put it to the test. That has the idea of to, to judge it, to not judge it in a condemning way. We don't condemn the messenger who's trying to obey God, but we do judge it in terms of whether or not it's biblically based. Amen? If it's in line with the Holy Spirit-inspired Bible, the Scriptures, that's how we test it. We don't want to despise prophecy, but we want to be willing and able to test it. And one of the things you need to be aware of is there might be some out there that prophesy, and they don't want you judging. Some of these guys, uh, they are a little bit on the haughty side, and they'll say, well, who are you to judge a prophet of God? Well, who I am is a, is a child of God who has the Scripture uh, that tells me that I'm to judge prophecy. I'm not judging you, brother. I'm not judging you, sister, but I'm just judging the message as to whether or not it's in line with the Word of God. Are you following me? Amen.